getting started here in a couple minutes as soon as everyone gets uh, settled, so just hold tight. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, we kind of the idea uh, the Evening Sun had behind this event was, you know, there's a lot of events out there already that say heroin's a problem or other substance abuse disorders are a problem. At this point, I mean, we know that. So what we're hoping we can do tonight is kind of offer, you know, one part of that what's next part. You know, is what can, you know, the family members and loved ones of people addicted not only, not only to heroin but to any substance, you know, what, what do we do next and how do we keep ourselves sane? Um, so we're, we're hoping that that's what we can uh, provide for you guys tonight. And we also hope that this is just kind of the first step and, uh, you know, just the first of many events that we hold on this topic. Um, just so you know, a couple housekeeping things. We do have, we will have a live stream going for the Sandy's presentation. Um, none of the audience Q&A will be part of that. Audience members won't be part of that. The photographer who's taking pictures right now won't be taking photographs of anyone in this room aside from the speakers. Um, so if that's something anybody was concerned about, just so you're aware. Also, there's bathrooms out the door to the left and down the hall. They're pretty easy to find. Um, I think that's really all for me. I will turn it over to Lori here. At least it's not raining. <laughs> Got a break. I want to thank you so much for coming out tonight taking time out of your busy schedules, because I know you're all busy. So this says to me that this is an important issue for you. My name is Laurie James, and I am here as the mother of a recovering heroin addict. Chances are pretty good that you either know an addict, love an addict, live with an addict, have been an addict, have lost an addict, or have been directly or indirectly affected by an addict. I have a confession to make. I'm an addict. <laughs> to sweet tea. <laughs> okay. But it doesn't stop there. I like McDoubles, <laughs> fries, and chocolate-covered strawberry frappes. <laughs> I mean, it is written all over me. <laughs> uh, and thank goodness we live in a town with three convenient locations. <laughs> but I also know where they are in Littlestown, New Oxford, Gettysburg, York, and Westminster. <laughs> Recently, McDonald's came up with a brilliant idea for a Happy Meal toy. Little plush emojis. Okay. I mean, brilliant. There are hundreds to choose from. They could do this from now until the end of time, never do the same one twice. 
And it's also time efficient, because they don't even have to ask you, is it for a boy or a girl? All right, so when we started collecting these, <laughs> I think I have four already. Um, they don't give it to you for sweet tea, though. You've got to buy a Happy Meal. Um, it got me to thinking about all of the emotions that my family and my friends have gone through over the past seven years. Many times those feelings are so intense and confusing that you can't even put a name on them. You can't possibly. I wonder what the emoji would look like when you have to tell your child that she can no longer live in your house if she chooses to use drugs. Frustration, incredulousness, Guilt, shame, worry, ineptitude. A small yellow plush circle can't come sh close to showing what that's like. What would the emoji look like when you've had to call Child Protective Services and retain a lawyer to gain legal custody of your grandchild? to protect him. Shock, terror, determination, realism, sorrow. Wait, here's the emoji for when you realize you're going to be the mother of a two-year-old in your 50-somethings. <laughs> but now it's really cool. What would the emoji look like when you get a call in the middle of the night that your child has overdosed. You gotta roll fear, anger, fatigue, gratitude for the policeman who saved her life, hopefulness in that maybe this will be the last time, hopelessness in what if there's no one there the next time to call 911. Small, yellow circle, just isn't going to do it. What would the emoji look like when you hear a recording that says, this is a call from an inmate at Baltimore County Detention Center. Exasperation, concern, panic, and relief. There isn't anybody that can offer you a blanket solution to this epidemic. But what we'd like to offer is a blanket of community. Because, as you can see, you're not alone. I can't tell you what to do or what not to do. I'm not a professional counselor. But for myself, I've learned a few things the hard way. Maybe some of these will help you. No matter what you think or feel about yourself, whether you have regrets, you've made mistakes, you've done wrong, you did not do this to your loved one. It is not your fault. In relationship to the addict, remember, you cannot control it, you cannot change it, you cannot cure it, that's up to the addict. Addiction is a disease. Nobody would choose to live that way. No amount of love, worry, anger, pleading, or policing, believe me, I was a great detective, it, nothing will make them stop. They have to choose it. Educate yourself about addiction. There are many, 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 many resources. Don't enable your loved one by giving them money. Do only what you can to help them and nothing to hurt them. If the addict that you love is actively using, purchase Narcan. In the first 18 months that police were allowed to carry and administer Narcan 
to people that were overdosing. 635 lives were saved just in Pennsylvania. 635 lives. That's 635 mothers and fathers who thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I am just one of them. Don't belittle, criticize, or nag the addict. They already don't like themselves. Just keep loving them and say it often. This is really important. Get help for you. Seek it. Find it. Ask for it. Embrace it. Whether it's professional counseling, someone in your church ministry, support groups like Naranon, Facebook groups that are specifically for addicts and families of addicts, whatever it is, seek that help. Reach out. Live your life. Do what fills your heart and soul. Don't just survive. Live. I think this is most important. Keep your hope intact. Every single day, an addict wakes up and chooses to live life without the poison of heroin. Never give up on that person. Never. Thank you. About a year ago, I was on Facebook, and uh, I came across a, a post from um, someone whose son is a, an active addict. And she wrote a book. And I messaged her to find out if she might want to do a speaking engagement. And she graciously called me, and we talked on the phone. We've talked a number of times. And I was absolutely, she sent me her book, and I was absolutely blown away by the fact that she could put in words what I was feeling in a very, very beautiful way. And I'm very, very honored to introduce you to Sandy Swenson. I'm not sure if Lori introduced herself there, and I didn't do a very good. Oh, did okay. It's all my notes. It's all in your notes, okay. Um, Lori's from Hanover, and so we wanted to make sure we have a local voice in here. Um, and then before Sandy brings her presentation, just to kind of uh, just really cement that idea that this is everywhere. You know, Sandy's from you know living in Texas right now. Lori's in Hanover. There's people all over the country who are going through this. So not only are you not alone in this room, but throughout the entire country, just multiply this by, I don't even, I wouldn't even know what kind of number, but, um, so that was kind of, uh, it's kind of what we're hoping to get across right now. Thank you. Hi, I'm so glad to see you all here. There's even some familiar faces from Facebook, and people have messaged me, so I'm really glad to see all of you. I'm honored to be here, to be a part of this effort, to open minds and hearts and eyes to the elusive truths of addiction. You are not alone, and together we are stronger. My son Joey has been battling addiction since his teens. He's now 28. He's, oops. <laughs> I don't know what this is. <laughs> okay, and I won't touch that again. <laughs> okay, let me start over there. My son Joey has been battling addiction since his teens. He's now 28. He's not in recovery and is a chronic relapser. He's been in and out of some of the best rehabs in the country and yet never stayed long and refuses to ever return. He's been in jail, he's been over homeless, he's overdosed and taunted death countless times. 
I've held his limp hand as he lay dying. Joey lives in Florida, where he's been stuck since being kicked out of his last rehab in 2008. I fly down from Texas to see him once a year. Sometimes we talk on the phone. Sometimes we exchange a few texts. But we no longer discuss his addiction, because we've learned there's no point. Joey and I have an unspoken understanding that our brief time together is for making new, pleasant memories to hold on to. It's not a relationship that a mother dreams of, but given the circumstances, it's better than it could be, and I'm grateful for that. My story, like so many others, is a story without closure. I wrote my book, The Joey Song, for parents like me, parents living in this place where love and addiction meet, a place where help enables and hope hurts. For parents trying to figure out the difference between helping their child to live and helping them to die. For parents grieving the loss of a child who's still alive. I'd like to share an excerpt from my book, The Joey Song. It's a love story, not one any mother would ever hope for, but it's a love story nonetheless. Written from the place where I live, the place where love and addiction meet, this is the Joey song. What? <laughs> Did I do that? <laughs> Today, Joey returns to the place where his life began, on a stretcher. Cruising down the coastal highway in a four-door sedan at 50 miles an hour, Joey slammed into an SUV, a line of mailboxes, and a stone wall. No brake marks before bouncing into oncoming traffic. He arrived here in an ambulance, bloodied and unresponsive, with enough alcohol in his bloodstream to kill him if his internal injuries don't kill him first. 20 years, five months, and six days ago, Joey tumbled into my world at this very hospital. We greeted each other, this baby and I, but we already knew each other. We were already in love. He nestled in where he belonged, close to the heart on which his, he'd left indelible handprints, and into the arms whose most important purpose was now to protect, care for, and love. But I can't hold Joey in my arms this time. He's too wrecked all over, too battered, bruised, and scraped. I'm afraid of hurting him, but my longing to touch Joey is greater than my fear. I find a small spot on his blood-crusted forehead where it seems safe to place a soft kiss, and I hold on to his cold, limp hand. He's so pale, so gray, so still. The only sound is the dirge of whirs and beeps and gurgles, the sucking and trickling of life's juices through a tangle of tubes and mechanical attachments, and the whimpering. I think the whimpering is me. Joey fills the entire bed. The six-foot length of his body sags down the elevated slope. His legs all crumpled and akimbo at the bottom. His hospital gown reveals he's more bone than meat. Joey's hands and feet, like a puppy's paws, don't fit the rest of him. But Joey's not as thin as the last time I saw him, back several months ago, back when I told him it hurt more for me to hang on than to let go, back when I told him I was done trying to help him until he was ready. This is not what I thought ready would look like. Joey doesn't move, not the tiniest bit, other than the mechanical expansion of his chest. He doesn't know I'm here, but still, I talk. I want to reach the part of him in prison for so many years. Maybe I can slip past the wily warden of addiction and touch Joey while he's unconscious. 
I tell Joey I love him bigger than the moon, that I flew here as quickly as I could, and that his dad's plane will land soon. Joey, you were in a car accident. No one else was injured. And then I lie. Things will be better now. I cannot breathe. I pray for more time. Sitting at his side, I pat Joey's stiff and bloodied hair. Golden locks I've washed a thousand times between bubbles and boats. I no longer see the addict my son has become, a person I no longer know at all. Instead, I see my little boy, snug in his innocence, transposed over this wounded, lifeless man face. I see the glow of his smooth cheeks peeping out from under rumple covers as I stand over his small bed late at night. A sob escapes me as I remember the little boy with the sticky giggle who one long ago day asked me to sing him his special song. Mommy, will you sing me the Joey song? Hmm, the Joey song? Wriggling onto my lap like an angel's puppy, Joey looked up at me with his blue eyes. I silently willed the song to come to mind. Oh, the joy song. My heart warmed. For countless renditions, Joey had heard my crooning as a love song, a love song about him. And so I held my little fellow tight and sang the song that had tender new meaning, the song that was so much more wonderful sung his way. I've got that Joey, 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 Joey down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I've got that Joey, 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 Joey down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. Dusting off the old song now, I lean close to Joey's ear and I sing. A damp and croaky whisper, I sing the Joey song, hoping to reach something deep within this lost child of mine to stir up memories of love, a love so much better than the love he has for the things that feed his addiction. I want to take Joey back to a time before all the pain. I sing softly. I don't want the addict to hear. I ache for Joey to believe what can't be seen. These recent years have been the test of the strength of my heart, but the strength of my love has never wavered. Not even under pressure of the mind-bending contortions imposed by his addictions. Joey, can you hear me? It's love that kept me from helping you to hurt yourself any longer. It is love that kept vigil while I waited for you to hit bottom that wasn't dead. It's love that brought me here to you now. He doesn't know I'm here. He doesn't move. Never could I have imagined an illness so cruel. With its insidious ways and nasty grin, addiction not only snuffed out my child's emerging light, it broke bonds and hearts and all the rules. Addiction is the destroyer of everything. The ICU nurse asked me to leave the room. She needs to do something with the tube that sucks black stuff from somewhere deep inside Joey. I button my sweater against the surprise chill of the night air as I step outside the hospital lobby. Taking a few steps away from the door, I sit down on a bench in the shadows. My mind rummages through Joey's life for explanations. Why is my son at this moment breathing only because of some machine he's connected to? Why did he slug down so much alcohol but that he may never again open his eyes? Maybe I'm fooling myself. But I see a life full of bedtime stories and family dinners, camping and fishing trips, togetherness and great opportunities. Sure, there were bumps in the road and roads not taken, but there were no ugly ogres or catastrophic events along Joey's way. Everything was so right before it went so wrong. 
so full and happy and promising, before the destroyer of lives slithered in. There is no reason for this tragedy. There is nothing for me to grab onto, damn it. There's nowhere for me to put the blame. I do, however, see a long string of missed clues. Whatever was happening, whatever was brewing, growing, looming, as Joey's parents, Joe and I didn't notice, even though it happened right before our eyes and under our noses. Sort of like not noticing a child's growth spurt until many inches later, or not noticing the icy surf on your toes after a long afternoon's tumble of waves. The pain of Joey's addiction has taken a toll on Joe and Rick and me over the past several years. As a family, as a married couple, and as individuals, we're like the three blind men in the fable, trying to identify the elephant by groping our way along the trunk, the tail, the leg, each of us feeling the truth of our own experience. We rarely agree on just how okay, honest, or high Joey is at any given time, giving rise to conflict among us. Oh, the toxic corrosion of addiction. More often than not, Joey is the elephant in our living room. Joe keeps reality at bay with loud laughs and big dreams and running long races. Rick, after so many years of so little brotherhood, can pretend he's an only child to escape the drama of overdoses, arrests, and chaos. And I disturb everyone's peace by talking about everything until it hurts all of us with every breath. So I don't dredge everything up anymore as much. I've heard it said that if you shake any family tree, an addict will fall out. And sadly, I've discovered this to be true. More families are dealing with the addiction of a loved one than I ever would have guessed. The tragedy unraveling those families is similar in its destruction, different only in the details, and too often it's kept secret. When addiction grabs a child, it chokes a parent. I know the life-draining squeeze of its grip. I have never felt so incapable and helpless, so sad, so lonely, such fear. My child has been stolen from me, stolen from himself, and I mourn Joey's loss and suffering from a very solitary place. There is no broad community empathy or support for the families of addicts. There's no rallying cry of solidarity, no pretty ribbon brigade, and none of the comfort that so often gets baked into meatloaves and muffins. Instead, there are closed doors and mouths and minds and hearts. I want addiction to be understood, not misrepresented, misjudged, and mishandled, not hushed up or hidden away. Nasty things grow most freely in dark corners. The scourge of addiction needs to be dragged out into the light. Addiction has pummeled my family. Beating it back has been one long, hard fight. These mother's hands of mine, these nubby, bloodied claws have seen battle. The battle between hanging on and letting go. The battle between barely hanging on and hanging in there. The battle to survive the unexpected and the battle just to survive. Battered and bruised I may be, but now I'm stronger and wiser. I finally understand there's nothing more I can do to help my son other than love him and support him in a quest to help himself. Still, 
I carry around the very maternal and human need to do something. And I need to do something with this need to do something. So I share my story. One mother's story of love and loss and learning and surviving my son's addiction while coming to terms with the fact that he may not. Before my son was an addict, he was a child. He was my child. But he could have been anyone's child. He could have been or might yet be yours. Until the trouble started, I never thought my child would become an addict. It never crossed my mind until one day it did. Before my son was an addict, he liked to fish and camp. He was an Eagle Scout and a rescue diver. He built a playground for orphans in India. He wanted to be a marine biologist, and he was awarded scholarships from several colleges. He also sometimes lied and said things that were mean and sulked and was crabby. In other words, he was perfectly normal. There's a widely held belief that addicts are bad people. But the truth is, addiction is not an issue for moral judgment. Addiction has nothing whatsoever to do with whether a person is nice, or the quality of their character, or the strength of their will. Addiction is a disease. Scientific research has proven this. The addicted brain exhibits measurable changes. This is fact. And most addiction begins in adolescence, strongly enticed by popular culture. Addiction begins where dalliance, or doctor's orders, becomes a disease. It can happen to anyone who's taken a sip, a puff, a snort, or even a pill prescribed for pain. Even though my son has done some bad things while being an addict, my son is not a bad person. He's a sick person. When addiction scooped up my child, it did so indiscriminately. Joey, at his core, is one of the least bad people I know. Before my son was an addict, I used to judge the dusty addict on the corner very harshly. But now I know that being an addict isn't something that anyone would ever choose. Now I know that the addict in the corner has been my sweet child and could someday be yours. I wish I hadn't waited for the worst to happen before I opened my eyes and heart, before I looked beneath the addict's dust to the person he was meant to be, to the person my child could just as easily have become and did. Before my son was an addict, he was a child, not a monster. Addiction can happen to anyone. Once upon a time, I was just a mom, a regular mom. When I held my little miracle in my arms for the very first time, I rubbed my cheek on his fuzzy head and whispered, Joey, my beautiful son, I will love and protect you for as long as I live. I didn't know then that my baby would become an addict before becoming an adult, or that the addict taking his place would shred the meaning of those words to smithereens. When Joey tumbled into my world, he arrived without an instruction manual. But I was the best moms I could be, as someone with good intentions and no experience. I stumbled through parenthood like everyone else, rocking my baby to sleep, kissing the scraped knees of my little boy, setting unwelcome limits for my sometimes testy teen, and hoping I was doing things kind of right. Then, slowly at first came the arrests and the overdoses, the needle marks and the dealers interspersed with big fat lies. 
My loving child was turning into a stranger, manipulating me and using me and twisting my love for him into knots. But I was befuddled by the scary new world I didn't even know I was in and that I knew nothing about. You see, I thought I was still just a regular mom stumbling through regular parenthood like everyone else. Addiction is a disease, but not even the professionals have it all figured out yet. And they aren't trying to figure it out while in a bland, blind panic, running through the fires of hell with fears and dreams and maternal instincts tripping them up. So I shouldn't feel like a total failure for having missed so many clues and for not being able to love and protect my child as I promised. But still, sometimes I do. Joey became an addict in his teens, lured to drugs and alcohol by a culture that glorifies substance abuse. The same culture that later, so ignorantly and harshly, passes judgment on him and on me. I'm judged for helping or fixing or pushing or not helping or fixing or pushing enough. The sick child of mine who won't be helped or fixed or pushed. I'm judged for overreacting and for underreacting, enabling and letting go, and most hurtful of all, as a mother whose love must somehow be flawed. Once upon a time, I was just a regular mom, stumbling through parenthood like everyone else. And then I had to figure out how to be the mom of an addict. I had to figure out how to love my child without helping to hurt him. How to grieve the loss of my child who's still alive without dying. And how to trade shame and blame for strength. To be the mom of an addict is to be an ambassador of truth and understanding. No more shame, no more silence. Joey dreamed of becoming a firefighter, a fisherman, and a marine biologist when he grew up. Becoming an addict was not on his list. I know the son who dreamed those dreams, and he is a son to be proud of. When Joey was little, he would put his most favorite book and stuffed animal on my pillow every night. When he was a little older, he started opening doors for old ladies and moms carrying kids, not because I told him to, but because he was nice. And when older still, he wasn't embarrassed to say, I love you, or dole out big hugs. Yes, Joey is a son to be proud of, tender and thoughtful and smart. He should be living his dreams. But Joey isn't here. An addict has taken his place. Someone who looks like Joey is hooked to the strings of an evil puppeteer and living a tortured life. Instead of fighting fires, Joey's fighting demons. Instead of time flies, he's flying high. Instead of exploring the ocean, he's sleeping alone on the beach. Joey lives for his next drink or next drug. Addiction took his dreams, gobbled them up, and spat out a nightmare. No, Joey didn't dream of becoming an addict, and it certainly wasn't what I dreamed for him either. But I'm not ashamed my son is an addict. I'm sad my son is an addict. By shining the light on addiction, I might just get him back. I did not cause my son to become an addict. As a parent, I don't possess that power. Addiction happens because a renegade sip or snort or sniff crosses an invisible line between want and need. When my sons were little, I imagined I had all kinds of power. I could decide when it was time to put them down for a nap, but they might play in their cribs rather than fall asleep. I could serve up a healthy dinner, 
But if they didn't want to eat the small mound of lima beans on their plates, they did not. I could teach my sons right from wrong and good from bad, but my word alone often wasn't enough, and they experimented to see how those rights and wrongs worked. It soon became clear that while I could be their guide, my boys were going to be who they were meant to be. My real power as a mom was simply to love them and, of course, to annoy them and piss them off. <laughs> Depending on the kid and the phase, the age, the mood, and the moment, as a parent, I was sometimes perceived to be too nosy, too hovering, and on occasion, not hovering enough. I sometimes didn't listen carefully when I should have, and sometimes I listened in when I should have not. I hurt my children's feelings. I made them feel angry and sad and unheard and misunderstood. Try as I might to be otherwise, I'm an imperfect mom. Imperfect parenting, however, does not cause children to become addicts. If that were so, every child in the world would grow up to be one. Maybe I drove Joey to drink, so to speak. Maybe he was hurting or mad or embarrassed of this old gal who brazenly adored him for the sweet boy he was. Or maybe Joey was insecure and uncomfortable with the process of growing up. Whatever his reason for first using drugs and alcohol, Joey was also enticed towards the glamorized hole filler by popular culture since birth even though I taught him to just say no. Substance abuse and addiction are not the same thing, however. As a child, a child, substance abuse was a choice Joey made. But why he started and why he can't stop are two different things. Addiction picked, snuck up on my son, picked him out of the substance abusing crowd and choked him. Substance abuse is a choice. Addiction is a disease. As a parent, I made a lot of mistakes, but causing my son to be an addict is not one of them. Addiction is a disease, not a disgrace. A misunderstood tragedy, too often hushed up. Well, no more secrets. Not anymore. For 10 years, my son has been dying a slow death, enticed as a young teen to drink and do drugs by the very same culture that now looks with shock upon his addictions as a moral failure. Shame and blame and disdain. If Joey were dying a slow death from cancer, the world would reach out with comfort. But with addiction, stigma gets in the way. With addiction, I don't get to sit at my son's bedside holding his hands while we fight this battle together. Instead, I sit empty-handed watching as my son kills himself. With addiction, we each walk through hell all alone. While well, I say, no more shame, no more silence. When addiction is understood as a disease, it will be treated like a disease. But this is an understanding that will happen only when those of us who love an addict stop hiding addiction as though it's a disgrace. We'll know when we've succeeded once comfort is baked into bun cakes, as it is for every other disease. I've heard it said that for every addict, another four lives are affected. Considering the damage left in Joey's wake, that number seems really low. But it indicates that at least half our population suffers with the pain of addiction in one way or another. 
There's just no room in this crowd for stigma and secrets. Too many of us try to carry our burden in silence while walking through this hell all alone. And too many of us try to contort a visible truth into a hidden lie. But even cloaked in all this secrecy, addiction is rarely truly a secret. Friends, neighbors, and co-workers perceive the shadows of scandal going on behind our shroud shame. Our lies, avoidance, lowered heads and averted eyes. These behaviors only perpetuate the notion that addiction is something to be ashamed of. Once I shed my shame, once I began to say out loud that my son suffers from the disease of addiction, the people around me were, for the most part, warm and supportive, their suspicions put to rest. And for those who weren't supportive, well, that just wasn't my problem. The truth set all of us free. Once the truth was out in the light where it belongs, so too was the conversation. Addiction is a disease, not a disgrace. My baby grew up to be an addict. There was a time when I believed a mother's love could fix anything, but it can't fix this. For too many years, I thought I was helping Joey. I thought I was doing my job by keeping him out of trouble, getting him out of trouble, and believing his lies. I snooped and stalked and tried to out-manipulate his manipulations. I did everything and anything I could to make things right. I tried to keep my child from suffering because that's what a mother's love does. I loaned Joey money when times were tough, but not wanting to make times tougher, I didn't ask him to pay the money back. I made excuses for Joey's new self-centered meanness, and I pretended not to notice when he missed my birthday or when his place at our Thanksgiving table remained empty. I believed Joey's explanations for his sunken eyes and shaking hands and I believed his convoluted denials of drug overdoses and emergency DOA revivals. Well, sort of. When Joey was arrested, the times I knew about, I showed up in court as a reminder that he was loved and had a reason to head in another direction. I even stayed when he bared his teeth at me and hissed. I wrote letters to the judge doing damage control pleading for Joey to be sentenced to rehab, not jail. And then I listened as Joey blamed everyone he could think of for why he did end up in jail. The only person not to blame was the one looking at me from the other side of the smudgy glass. Three times Joey was convinced or cornered into going into addiction treatment. And three times Joey played it and everyone around him like a game, and then walked away. I connived, I wheedled, I cried, I begged, and I continued to aid and abet and enable like a champ. I did everything I could to protect Joey from himself until finally I realized it wasn't him that I was, help that I was protecting. I was protecting the addict making it easy for the addict, giving the addict one more day to further consume my son's body and mind. I was helping the addict to kill the son that I was trying to save. My motherly love would need to be contorted and redefined. There's nothing about this kind of love that feels good, but I'm not doing it for me. The expression tough love doesn't mean to be mean. It's called tough love 
Because accepting the impossibility of changing someone else's behavior is tough to do. Loving an addict has nothing to do with anger or meanness. I will do nothing ever again to help the addict. Because if I do, I have no hope of ever seeing my son. I love Joey, and it's because I love him that I'm done paying the addict's ransom. On the day Rick was born, his big brother was eagerly waiting for him. At two and a half years old, Joey was going to be Rick's faithful friend and special act to follow. And follow, Rick did. Rick followed as Joey demonstrated to how to crawl backwards and forwards and sideways, how to ride a bike without training wheels, and how to catch a fish with just the right flick of the wrist. Rick watched and learned the art of good aim in the bathroom, of fair play in the backyard, of epic whoppers and burps, and of raw, royal, loyal love. For 13 years, my sons were best brothers on most days. But now, at ages 25 and 28, they are strangers. My sons are strangers. Addiction did this. Instead of fishing or even fighting, my sons no longer know who the other is. Ten long years have passed since the attic stole Rick's brother's place. The scary stranger showed up when Rick was in the eighth grade. So Rick was just a kid when Joey was last a part of his life. Well, that's not quite all right. Joey has been a big part of Rick's life, even in his absence. Sucked into the vortex of his older brother's addicted chaos, Rick's life has been affected by choices that weren't really choices and by cataclysmic loss. But somehow, even before his boy voice cracked and turned deep, Rick understood a love that wasn't always fair or easy. Bug-eyed and reeling, Rick was never resentful as his dad and I tried to save his older brother. Chasing or dragging Joey and his latest problem across the country or world. Not even when we abandoned him on his 16th birthday. Or his first days of high, a new, in a new high school. In a new town. Or even when we left him parentless in a foreign country. When Rick graduated from high school, Joey was in jail and in big trouble. And when he graduated from college, Joey was completely unaware of the accomplishment and in even deeper trouble. The ghost of Joey's mistakes hovered over everything Rick did and didn't do, and so did his dad and I, skittish and fearful and trying to learn from our own mistakes. Growing up could not have been easy for Rick but he's strong and stable, forgiving and loyal, in spite of everything. Rick is a fine young man, walking his own fine path. One of the many things addiction has destroyed is the natural order of things. Rick is now Joey's special act to follow. If only he would. Most enablers are well-intentioned. We act out of kindness, not realizing we've been lured to the tip of the skewer by the addict. We try to rescue the addict from himself by fixing his circumstances and kicking his troubles down the road. Other enablers do the deed through denial. Low stamina for high alert, party buddy preservation, or simply because they couldn't care less. And then there are the enablers who adhere to an unwritten code that commands loyal protection from getting in trouble. These enablers guard secrets that shouldn't be kept, like drinking while driving, 
overdosing or relapsing to be nice. I wish I could contain the enabling of everyone around Joey, but I don't have enough fingers and toes to plug up the endless leaks in that dam. I can only control my own enabling, and that is difficult enough. But I've, over time, I've figured out this. If the addict is happy with my help, then I'm probably enabling. If the addict says he hates me, then I'm probably helping the son that I love. The addict pushes away the people who get in his way. The ones setting up roadblocks and shining lights in dark corners and speaking truths. But he clings to and flatters those who so accommodating allow him to thrive. My son has pushed away me and everyone else who truly care about him, surrounding himself instead with people who make his pathetic addicted existence comfortable, people who make it easier for him to use, the enablers. But every time Joey has been broken or dying, those enablers disappeared. I'm sure the mess wasn't theirs to worry about if they bothered to think about him at all. The enablers won't lose a single night's sleep if Joey dies, but I will. If Joey sneezes, I'm not the one who should leap for a tissue, and I'm not the one who should want to. I'm not helping Joey by doing things for him that he can and should do for himself. Instead, by diminishing my expectations, I diminish his capabilities. What I'm doing is unabling. Unabling means helping to make a person that I'm helping unable to manage his task or his life on his own. It's crossing boundaries, reducing responsibilities, removing consequences, and cheating him of all the things that adults need to live and love life on their own. It's an escape hatch to hell. I will not give in, hand out, set up, or fix up the messes and catastrophes until I am inevitably unable to enable, or unwilling, or burned out. I will not help to leave Joey so unabled by my enabling that he is unable to handle the business of running whatever is left of his life after a lifetime of unabling. What happens to Joey if he never learns how to rescue himself? All I can and should do is help him to get the help he needs to help himself. That and love him. But really, that is everything. There was a time when I was tricked and manipulated and hated into helping the addict. Desperate, placating, and fearful, my love crouched behind a mirage of wishful thinking but not anymore. My love is no longer confused by delusion. The addict's hatred no longer has the power to get me all muddled up. It's not the addict I hope will be grateful for my love. It's my son. My son is the one who needs my support. My son needs to see my strength, my devotion, my resolve. My son needs me to face down his worst enemy, not help it. My son and the attic may share the same shadow, but they will not share my love. My son is the one that I want to see live beyond tomorrow. Once I stopped caring if the attic hated me, the attic hated me even more. He didn't like the word no. He yelled and cursed and threatened viciously pulling on heartstrings and fears, trying to trick me into betraying my son, but I didn't. 
My love is a rock solid foundation for my son to stand on or take his next step, not the addict. And now they both know it. Eventually the manipulative gyrations of the addict completely stopped. But my son continues to send occasional messages that warm my heart. Hi mom, I was thinking of you and just want to say I love you. I feel like I'm missing out on my amazing mom because I don't call very often. For seven years, the only thing I've been able to do for Joey is love him. Love him. The addict may hate me, but my son doesn't. And my son is the one who matters. I made a lot of mistakes trying to help Joey. Sometimes trying to treat him like an adult when he was acting like a child. And treating him like a child, though he's an adult. I tried warm, fuzzy love, and I tried tough love. I tried keeping him from hitting bottom, bringing the bottom up to him, and getting him into treatment when I thought he'd hit bottom. And I struggled to recognize the difference between helping and enabling. I tried so hard to stay on the right side of an invisible line between helping him to live and helping him to die. Through trial and error and lack of results, I learned that I cannot fix this for him. And I learned that I love him enough to bear the toughest love of all. Sometimes love means doing nothing rather than doing something. But there is a place in my life that's exactly Joey's size and I'm keeping it warm. The expression letting go implies, well, letting go, as in dropping or throwing away. And as any mother knows, that's just not possible. There's no letting go in a mother's heart, not of a hand once held. Even if that little hand grows into a big hand attached to a horrid addict. But that's not what letting go means. I now understand. Letting go means to let go of the things that aren't mine to hold on to. The things that have anything to do with addiction. So that's what I've done. I've had to let go before the ugly words and behaviors slithering in on the underbelly of addiction did irreparable damage to the relationship that had once been so good or killed the boy I was trying to save. But letting go is not the same as giving up. Once a year I travel to Florida to find Joey. Once a year I get to hold him tight. Wrapping him in my arms I get to feel the power of our dusty bond, a silent exchange of hope and strength and eternalness, of a love that has been bruised but never broken. I kiss his cheek, leaving a lipsticky mom mark when it's time, again, for me to let him go. I open my arms, empty, but now full, arms which will keep him snug and close to my heart until next time. In letting go of my son, I'm holding on tight to so much. In letting go of him, I'm letting him know that I believe in him. Like a hug full of my love, I let go believing that he will find his way back. I have the power. The power to change the way I react to the disease of addiction. 
the power to stop its destructive spread. For too many years, I was consumed by the poison that my son was consuming. I snarled and yelled and argued and begged and cried. I renegotiated the non-negotiable. I rationally discussed the irrational. And at night, I either paced the house, holding vigil for Joey's life, or dreamed of growing octopus arms to squash down all his problems. There was no room in my head for anyone but Joey. That's just what happens once an addict starts wearing a loved one's face. So while Joey was the one consuming the poison, the poison seeping into our household was passing directly through me, sneaking in on the umbilical connection. I was a carrier, the typhoid Mary of addiction, spreading misery and destruction through our family helping the disease to do what it does best. You see, for too many years, I was trying to change something that wasn't mine to change. Joey. The truth is, the only thing I can change is me. And that has real power. Addiction is horrible enough without me making it worse, so I'm done with that. There will be no more ripping apart of hearts and lives, not by my actions or my neglect, not by my words thrown around like poison darts. I will not blame or argue. I will not get sucked into dramas or force issues that don't belong to me. I will protect my boundaries, making room in my head for all the people I love. I will be calm, not crazed. I will be positive. I will have reasonable expectations. I will change the tune and change the dance. I will change my family's chance. This doesn't mean I don't care or don't hurt or won't cry. It just means I will fill the hole in my life where Joey should be with goodness, not badness. Kindness, not madness. I will honor my son with my words and my actions, not the addict. The destruct destructive spread of the disease of addiction stops with me. Joey will always be my child, but he is no longer a child. His choices and his desire to make good choices must come from within. I wish I could put my hands on Joey's brain and shuffle things around and make him think and do the things he needs to think and do in order to embrace recovery and get himself better. But I can't. Only he can do that. Joey needs to find his own hidden hero. Because in the end, the never ending end, it comes down to what it always comes down to, but keeps getting messed up. Only Joey can do what it takes to survive. As much as I wish it to be otherwise, only Joey can do it or Joey will die. The hardest thing I've ever done is to acknowledge that I cannot control my son's addiction recovery. But maybe the most important thing I've ever done is to let recovery begin with me. Joey's addiction has left a gaping hole in my life. Falling in the hole or filling it up are my only options. So I'm taking steps to fill it. Steps. Lots of them. Nothing as difficult as the 12 steps Joey will hopefully take one day, but I expect him 
But if I expect him to do the hard work of embracing recovery, then I need to expect the same hard work from myself. I will be the example of doing the right thing and sticking with it no matter how tough. Of moving ahead, one determined day at a time, of never giving up and never giving in. I will take care of what I can, even if Joey doesn't take care of himself. I will take steps toward letting go of the things that diminish me. Recovery can happen, even if it doesn't happen within the addict. And I've decided there's going to be some recovery in this recovery, no matter what. Self-care is an act of love that affects the whole family. There's truth to the old adage, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. But the one that says you're only as happy as your unhappiest child is false. The truth is, you can be as happy as you allow yourself to be. So I will seek peace, find beauty, spread kindness, and choose happiness. I will hang on to hope and healthy boundaries. I will forgive myself for what I didn't know before I knew it. I will take comfort in knowing that I've tried my best. I will laugh and play without guilt. I will nurture myself so that I can nurture the people who love and need me. Self-care is not selfish. Self-care is an example, and it's an example for Joey to see. And self-care ensures there will be something healthy remaining for Joey to return to when he's ready. Loving Joey is like grieving his death and fighting for his life at the same time, all while hated, judged, helpless, and alone. It's hope and belief that don't dare come out to play. It's a one-way street of trust and open arms. It's empty words, broken promises, shattered dreams, and tarnished memories. It's watching as the ship slowly capsizes in a storm and then waiting anxiously for it to right itself. It's nudging the baby bird out of the nest, only to discover it can't fly. It's heartbreaking beyond description. Life has ripped a great big chunk out of me, but for myself, for Joey, and for my family, I will do whatever it takes to patch the hole I will live the example. I will be the change that I wish to see. Just as with every other disease, a diagnosis of addiction establishes responsibility and expectation and requires adherence to a treatment plan. But unlike any other disease, this diagnosis is too often looked upon as an excuse a free pass, or gets our snar all snarled up in a twist of guilt and manipulation. Disease, all disease, is sad, is a sad, unfair, and unwelcome fact of life. Addiction is no different. Joey needs to learn how to manage this disease in his life because he's the one living his life. No one can take his medicine for him. I must empower without pitying. I must encourage a victor, not a victim. Joey must be allowed to fall down if he's going to learn how to pick himself up. A real paradox in conquering addiction, of course, is that the brain that is sick is the very same one that must do the work to get well. 
The path to recovery is unquestionably a winding, frustrating web of struggle and self-delusion. But only Joey can walk the walk. Only he can make the effort for the one person he will be spending the rest of his life with, the very worthwhile him. My message to Joey is loud and clear. I think you can. To let go is to love. I can do both and I can survive. Both of my boys set sail down the same river, but while Joey sailed by but while Rick sailed along smoothly, something rocked Joey's boat. Some perfect storm of personality, circumstances, and genetics knocked him off course. One bad choice made as a young teen led to another and another and choked off even others. One choice, that first choice, changed everything. This thing that has a hold on my son is strong. I cannot wish it away. I cannot ignore it away. I cannot love it away. This is a hard truth to accept, but accept it I must. Nothing about addiction is easy. It's a devastating disease. I can either make it worse or I can face it head on, eyes wide open, and behave in ways that will at least make it not worse. This is what I can control. There may be nothing I can say or do to stop Joey from doing what he's doing. There may be nothing I can say or do to make him change. But he needs to have a reason to stop, a reason to change, the pull of addiction needs to be counterbalanced by the obstinate presence of love. I will protect my boundaries. I will not allow myself to be drawn into the addict's destructive chaos. But as long as Joey's alive, I will find ways to sprinkle my love right alongside of my letting go. I'm learning to live without Joey, but like someone whose leg has been amputated, I often reach for the place where he once was without thinking. There's nothing phantom about the pain. There's no way to separate the void before me from what's been left behind. Joey may have been hacked from my life, but he's with me every step of the way as I move forward. Joey's addiction, whether he's in recovery or not, will last forever. But no matter where the addict takes my son, my love for Joey will follow. No matter what happens, I will try to put joy where Joey should be. I'm a whole lot stronger than I was when addiction first slunk its way into my world. And I'm much more aware. I know that I cannot change anyone other than myself. And I know I can and will try to do the right thing, no matter how hard. I know my capacity to love can be bruised but not broken. And if Joey's tide starts to drag me under, I know I need to escape the life-sucking pull, quickly moving out of the way until I'm safe. I'm not ashamed of Joey. I'm sad for him. And I'm not ashamed to be the mother of an addict. I will not behave as though addiction is a dark secret. And I'm not going to live like a cockroach hiding under a rock. In being open and honest about what the disease of addiction has done to Joey and our family, I hope to open eyes and minds and hearts and to comfort those on the same path. 
Let us never forget that it's the disease with which we do battle, not the addicts consumed by the disease and not the people who love them. Let us be one strong voice against addiction together. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Um, we're going to uh, move right along to the uh, heroin task force now, just to make sure we don't run too uh, short on time, and then we're going to try to wrap up here by 8.45. If we can um, fit question and answer in here, we will. Um, if not, um, everybody should have received a, uh, a paper coming in that points uh, you to our Facebook group, Saving York Adams from Heroin. Um, you're welcome to, point, to post any questions there that you might have for any of the speakers. Um, there are also reporters, um, Caitlin in the yellow shirt and then Lily in the white shirt up here. If you have any issues that you uh, think we need to be looking into, a, ser a story you want to share, anything like that, um, they're available. Um, so I will uh, turn it over to Pam Gay now. Thank you all for being here. Um, 